Welcome to the Deep Dive, the advanced web development podcast brought to you by InDev.dev. Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today we have a special guest. He's all the way from Belgium. He has been working at Info Support in Netherlands and Belgium for 10 years. He's living on the Belgium Belgian border side between the Netherlands and, and Belgian border. He's a lead developer in a team at Info Support. He recently became a maintainer of Mocha, and most importantly, today he's the lead on the Striker and mutation testing element projects. So please uh, give a warm welcome to Nico Jansen. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. Thanks for coming, Nico. So I heard you have an interesting story about a, a trip to Sweden. Could you tell us a bit about that? Uh, sure. I'm a bit of an electric car geek, um, and in 2015 we decided to go to Sweden for the uh, for the summer. Uh, and it, we left on the hottest day of the year and the hottest day ever recorded. And um, yeah, the Renault Zoe doesn't have an uh, active cooling system, which we found out because we started driving and the first time we stopped for charge, um, it didn't really go as planned. So um, I calculated that we had to stand there for 24 hours just to get uh, the battery full. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, if you want to leave on the hottest day ever recorded, please have acting cooling system. That makes sense. Uh, we did end up making it to the hotel, fortunately. And uh, uh, yeah, so from then on, we started planning the days a little bit more conservatively, not <laughs> try to make a thousand kilometers uh, in one day. And then it was fine. Uh, had an awesome vacation. And yeah, you, with an electric car, that doesn't charge fast like there are no Zoe you will see places that you would normally don't see so that's a lot uh, it was a really nice experience in the end oh nice where does this uh, interest come from um, I'm a big fan of sustainability um, I'm sitting now in my new house to build it we um, we had a lot of uh, yeah things to make it sustainable so we have a lot of solar energy here we don't use gas uh, we have now have two electric cars even so yeah I'm a big fan of sustainability please ask me anytime I can talk <laughs> hours well Nico I'm also working in energy so it's also a, a cost that's very dear to my heart I worked in, in many different companies in the energy industry so I I can appreciate that. Today, we're actually here to discuss mutation testing and the striker framework that you're maintaining. So maybe you could start with uh, what is mutation testing? Uh, mutation testing is a way to test your tests. Um, yeah, traditionally, you might know that we use code coverage. Um, it's a metric. It's nice. It's fast. If you're running your unit tests or integration tests with code coverage active, you measure the amounts of lines and branches that are being covered by the tests. And a lot of times people are mistaking that with uh, lines of code that are tested because that's different. Um, it's easy to write a unit test that uh, covers 100% of your code, but still don't have any asserts and therefore it's not testing anything. Uh, you might have a, a junior developer that uh, doesn't know about testing a lot. I've seen it oftentimes that there are tests which don't actually test anything, just uh, doing some mocking and then forget to call the code and then assert and then they're done. Uh, or tests that are excluded. Um, and the only way to really know if your tests work is to introduce bugs in the code and see that tests are failing. That makes sense, right? If you don't have uh, bugs in your code and your tests are green, yeah. Are you also sure that they can fail if there are bugs? Um, and that's what mutation testing is all about. So mutation testing framework will go through your code and will make smart adjustments, uh, which it calls mutants. And then um, after you run the tests, you hope that tests are failing. Um, if so, then the mutant is killed. If not, the mutant survives to live another day. And if you have a lot of surviving mutants, yeah, probably you need to add some more tests. Okay, so mutation tests. We introduce what are called mutants. They actually go and change um, some attributes in your source code, and then they run the test again. And if they introduce, if the mutants uh, introduce a change, but uh, you don't have a failing test, well, then you you might not be testing very effectively. Is that a fair way to put it? 
Uh, yeah, I think that's that's correct. So, for example, um, you can make a, you can mutate a less than to a less than equal sign. You might think, well, that's not a big change. That's true, but probably it's a good thing to test for the the, the border cases. Um, if you ask a tester, that's what he would say. <laughs> um, so that's what we should do. And mutation testing is a way to spot those automatically. So it, you don't write new tests. Mutation testing should just run with your tests. Um, that's often something we hear is that, well, it takes a lot of time. It shouldn't. You should just configure it and, and run it and see how your tests are doing. And what are other examples of mutants? Uh, we do string mutations, for example. So we, we change a string uh, to an empty string and see if, if, if it's spotted. Um, we, uh, yeah, the, the easy ones are also plus, uh, will mutate to minus, uh, multiply to divide. So it's basically just turn them, turning them around. Um, but we also, uh, for JavaScript, for example, you have functions. We just empty them out. Uh, functions don't have to return anything in JavaScript. So it's easy to just say, well, let's just mutate this entire block to be an empty block. And that's also a popular one because that's that it, it's like a, a way to really fastly see, well, is, is something tested at least? Yeah, so it's kind of this mindset that if I make this change and your tests are not failing, why is that code even there? Apparently it's not doing anything or you're not covering it or you, you thought you covered it, but actually you didn't. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So it can also work that the other way around. Indeed, that you say, well, uh, why is this not? Why is this mutant surviving? And you go and look, and you see, well, this is dead code. It should never have been there. It's a, uh, it's uh, we changed this a month ago, and this should have been removed. For example, yeah. Or uh, what I uh, saw uh, last month was I was changing some code, and um, I was I was expecting the, the code to not be tested, but it was still. Uh, oh, it was still tested, but. Um, no, no, yeah, every mutant survived in a new piece of code. So I've, I added tests, but I forgot to do, uh, to do the actual call. So the actual, uh, even for me, because <laughs> I'm usually, uh, uh, contributing you know, to open source in the, in, at night or uh, in the evening, as you might imagine. So these, these things happen. And it's nice to know that mutation test framework has your back. So where, when, uh, when is it useful to do mutation testing? Should you do it as you write the code or? before you write your tests or in the end after doing the full implementation or can it be useful at different points in time? Ideally, I think you would want to run mutation testing in your CI CD pipeline. So whenever you have a change that will go to master or the domain branch, that's I think the point in time that you want to also run mutation testing. Um, but there's a, there's a downside to mutation testing that I haven't mentioned yet. But you might imagine it's it's a little bit slow. Um, you can imagine that, for example, a test run takes, I don't know, 20 seconds and you have a thousand mutants to test. Um, yeah, then it might take 20 seconds times a thousand mutants. So 20,000 seconds, it's not really feasible anymore. More in that case, so we have a lot of uh, stuff implemented in Striker, which we can I can elaborate today, um, which makes it a lot faster. But still, it it is more expensive than code coverage. So we're still working on that to make it feasible to run it in the CI/CD pipeline. Um, for Striker itself, we run it whenever we merge something to the main branch. Then we run Striker on the main branch. It's uh, also implemented in in a pipeline, but not just not in pull request time because it would take a little bit too long. So do you use Striker to test the Striker? repo? Yes, so uh, Striker consists of a couple of mutation testing frameworks, actually. Um, we also have Striker for .NET and Striker for Scala, but uh, the main Striker branch is for JavaScript and TypeScript, and we run, indeed, uh, so every uh, Striker mutation testing framework runs on its own code. Yeah. Very nice. Is there any other things that uh, the listener should know about mutation testing before going into the details? I think it's just really important to understand that it's for testing your tests. So it's not like uh, we're muting, mutating your code and shipping that or something or like, like a monkey uh, testing or that's totally different. This is just uh, actually making a copy of your source code because we don't even mutate your source code itself. Just make copies of it to make sure that uh, you don't, we don't ship it accidentally. And it's just mutating your code, your production code to measure the effectiveness of your tests. So it's kind of shifting left uh, chaos engineering at the code level. Yeah, that's a way to, to put it, I think, yeah. That's pretty fun as well <laughs> to, to kill mutants and, and all of that and then see that one survived and it says striker was here. It's pretty funny. 
<laughs> so if you have an empty string, we cannot mutate an empty string to an empty string. So we needed to add a line there. So we say, yeah, striker was here. That's the mutant. Yeah, that made me laugh. <laughs> Okay, so um, the result of running mutation tests, um, at least with Striker, you get what's called a mutation score, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, when a mutation testing framework runs, um, you can calculate the percentage of survived mutants, and that's called mutation score. You can compare it to a code coverage score. So percentage, uh, it's easy uh, to understand. The higher the percentage, the better. Like if you have 100%, then you're done. So basically, that's the reason for it to be to exist. So you have something to measure over time. Is there a good rule of thumb for the mutation score target or lower limit? Um, yeah, I've seen two use cases for this. For this, um, some people say I want to see 100%, um, and then whenever they have run into issues, uh, for example, a mutant uh, can actually always survive. There's no way to kill it. Uh, this can happen, for example, if you have a piece of code that is there just to enhance performance, so like an early return in the in the function. But it, if you leave it out, then the code will still work. For example, so if we mutate that, yeah, it will probably survive. So then the people are saying, yeah, we should exclude those mutants because I want to see 100%. So that's one one uh, type of people. And the other people are saying, yeah, like we are doing, we have just a benchmark of 80%, and then whenever we fall below it, we get a red build and Above is it's fine. Um, so that, yeah, it's just it's really hard to say what will work in your project. Um, yeah, it also depends what kind of code it is, right? If it's like banking software on the server, you might want to have a higher score than having a proof of concept uh, uh, thing uh, or or a back office application or yeah. So just try it out and see what works for you. Okay, but at least eighty percent sounds like a, a good uh, target if you don't have any other idea of what to strive for. Yeah, I would say probably if you want to to add it to an existing code base, run it once, see what it is, and yeah, put put a breaking point at that at that exact score, for example. So that way, you at least know you're not going backwards. Yeah, that's a good advice. Okay, the mutation score is actually it consists of several other metrics, but maybe we could discuss them later. Yeah, it's a little bit more complicated than just saying survive mutants uh, percentage, but basically what it is, yeah. So you did mention slowness of mutation testing compared to regular testing, or at least unit testing and integration testing. But I also know you have been doing a lot of performance improvements in, in all of the Striker frameworks. For example, you just released version 4 of Striker, the one for JavaScript. And you have this concept of, of mutation switching. What is that all about? So back in, I think it was 2018, um, we started with with uh, the, the striker for .NET, for C Sharp, and for Scala. They actually, uh, we found interns to do them both. So that's basically how we create frameworks. We find interns to do like the or, the original research, um, and then well, we had added for JavaScript, and our company thought, well, it makes sense to have it for .NET as well and for Scala as well because we're also doing projects in those areas. Um, and we we wrote the internships and. Um, the interns came and they figured out, well, uh, if you want to mutate C Sharp or Scala and you do that on source code level, um, yeah, every mutant has to be compiled in that case to actually runnable code. And then you can run the, the tests on the on that mutant. And it takes a long time, as you can imagine, because C Sharp is slow, Scala is even slower to compile. So that wasn't feasible at all. It's like for a happy, uh, happy world, uh, for Hello World application, it might might be feasible, but not for business applications. And it will take, for example, it might take a couple of weeks to run. Yeah, <laughs> totally unacceptable. Um, so they thought of a way uh, how we can speed it up, and uh, yeah, they are brilliant because they thought of well, let's just put all the mutants in the code at once, and then compile once. Um, but yeah, one you cannot actually do mutation testing with multiple mutants active at the same time because one mutant can interfere interfere with another and also for example if you have 100 mutants and the tests fail how would you know right which which mutant was killed um but then they thought of well let's put if statements in the code or uh, case switches, which, hence the name mutation switching, um, to say, well, there, there can be, all the mutants can be in the code, that's fine. They can just not be active at the same time. So that's what mutation switching does. It, you'll add global variable, for example, that's that's called active mutation. Um, and you put the state there to say, oh, now this mutant is active. Um, and you can see it, yeah, it's just an if statement in the code if 
for example, active mutation is one, then do the mutation mutated codes, otherwise do the original codes. And it's always like that. So it's always the else or the default case if you do switching with switch case uh, statements. Uh, the else is always um, like the normal codes. Yeah. So is that also faster in JavaScript and TypeScript? And that's the question, right? So, um, of course, mutation switching makes a lot of sense in compiled languages, but why would you do it for JavaScript? Well, it turns out, as you might know, that we rarely write JavaScript that runs in the browser direc directly. You usually have a build step. With Angular, you have the Angular CLI. With Vue, you have the Vue CLI. With, uh, with React, you have probably React scripts or something else. They all use or either uh, Rollup or Webpack. Some of them use TypeScript. So there's a lot of uh, building being done. And you might imagine that you have to do that for each mutant if you don't have mutation switching. So it's still, uh, for the most, most business applications, it still makes a lot of sense to do mutation switching, even even though you're writing JavaScript. That's an interesting point, yeah. Um, there is another performance improvement on the radar or on the roadmap, I think. Uh, what was that called? I think it's hot reload. Is that uh, one you're mentioning now? Yeah. So um, maybe one step back. We also have coverage analysis. Um, so it, it makes sense um, to, well, how, what's one way to speed it up? Uh, mutation switching is like one way, but another way is, well, let's just not do more work that's useless. Um, and if you have a mutation in file A, why would you run unit tests on file B? So this is what cover, uh, coverage analysis does. Um, it will analyze, anal analyze your uh, code coverage um, and then we'll say, well, we don't run tests which are not needed for this mutant. So if you uh, mutate, let's say, uh, line six in file A, we only run the tests that ever actually cover line six in file A. So we do code coverage on test level. So that speeds up a, a tremendously, as you might imagine, especially in larger projects where you have a lot of tests. And if you have a decent unit tests, they don't cover the entire application and then it saves you a lot of time. And then, um, so yeah, for hot reloads, um, we're not supporting that right now, but that's one of our future uh, things that we are, are implementing um, is that well, we now have mutation switching. We don't need to reload even your test files. For example, if you use Karma to run your test, you might know that Karma runs your tests in a browser. And if you programmatically run Karma twice, it will always do a browser reload um, because it will assume, yeah, your tests uh, changed or the source file changed, so we need to reload them. Um, and for Mocha, the same thing. So if you want to rerun Mocha tests on the server, you have to unload the files and reload them. This is, for example, what Mocha Watch uh, does underneath. So the watch mode in Mocha will do that for you. Um, Jest will also do this. But for mutation testing with mutation switching, it's not really needed to reload the files because they're already loaded and they won't change. We just change the global variable that says which mutant is active. Um, so that will, I think, save a lot of time in larger projects, which have a lot of files. Um, for example, Striker has, I think, uh, hundreds of files at least, um, and it will have to reload all of them just to test a new mut mutant at this moment and we want to uh, to disable that so just make sure to load them once and then you keep running them um, until yeah until you're done so just uh, don't reload always rerun in the, in a hot environment so that's why it's called hot reloading okay super interesting so mutation switch switching that basically adds all the mutants at once and then a bunch of auto generated control flows and then basically a configuration turns on or off the different mutants in the same file, same modified source file. Yeah. And with, with hot reload, uh, even though a test fails, you don't have to restart the whole thing. Is that how it works, kind of? Yeah, you don't have to unload the files again and reload the files. Yeah, so mm -hmm. you can just keep them in memory. Don't uh, uh, don't reinstantiate the Mocha instance, for example, if you want to go nitty gritty. Just say, well, run again with the same configuration, except this global variable, which is called active mutant, is now not one, but it's now two, and then. Uh, you're testing different codes that way. And there's a little bit uh, of, you, you might think, well, this is awesome. Why don't you just, just do it now? Um, well, you might you might imagine for JavaScript especially, you have a lot of static code. So it's a little bit of a bad practice in different language, in other languages, but in JavaScript, yeah, we don't, we don't shy away from bad practices. <laughs> 
<laughs> you have control of the place. So yeah, what static code does is, well, it executes the code when you load the file and then it will never execute it again. So we will have to put mechanism in place with the, uh, again, with the coverage analysis, we can actually detect when this happens. And when we see it happening, yeah, then we say, okay, we have to rerun all the tests for this one mutant to uh, to test. Or we can even say, well, if you run, for example, with a, comp- with a flag called, I don't know, um, um, skip static mutants or something, we can say, well, do everything except these static mutants because they're really expensive, right? We need to, for example, if you have a thousand tests because it's one static mutant, for example, a static string somewhere, um, yeah, you have to uh, re- rerun all the tests, which might not make sense. So we have to think of ways to do that. But that's just, and yeah, of course, one other thing is that um, in the JavaScript world, we don't have like, um, a, a, I call it conventions. I like conventions, <laughs> but we don't have them in JavaScript, right? Where, put you, where do you put your tests? Uh, for example, um, is there a test runner protocol? It's another example. We don't have that in JavaScript. So uh, we have to implement this in the test runner plugins in Striker. Um, so we would have to implement it, for example, in the Mocha test runner plugin, in the Karma test runner plugin, and so forth for all the test runners. Okay. Uh, speaking of which test runners do you support in Striker? Um, currently, we support Karma, Jest, Mocha, Jasmine. I think that's it. Uh, but we also have the command test runner, which is ju- like a, a generic one. So ju- you can just give it any commands and it can run the tests, uh, can run mutation testing with it. So for example, you have uh, node tab, for example, is pretty pretty popular framework, but uh, we don't support it directly, but you can, of course, use the command test runner for it. Then we just switch the mutants on or, on or off with environment variables and it will still work. It's just a little bit slower because we cannot do the cover analysis because then we have to hook into the test framework we have to know which test is running at which time and that we don't have that then in that case it can still run oh, okay i see and uh, so you mentioned mocha and that's heavily used in node.js so that's a technology that is well supported by striker what about uh, client side web application frameworks um, so yeah, Karma probably is, is used there, or and otherwise you're probably using Jest. I think that those are the most popular ones. Yeah. How about something like Angular? Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, Angular uh, underneath uses Karma. So the Karma test runner plugin in Striker, you can configure it to start with ng test. So it's called uh, project type is Angular CLI. I think you can, you can just configure it, and then it will use uh, Angular uh, configuration. Okay, so if you use Angular CLI to start your project and then you want to add striker how would you do that yeah so we have a website called strikermutator.io it has it explains it basically you install the striker cli globally if you want it's not not um, not absolutely necessary but it's right now the easiest way and then you say striker in it inside your source directory and i think one of the first questions it will ask is do you have one of these projects it's like react view uh, uh, angular and if you say angular then uh, it maybe asks one more question but that's it then it just installs and, and runs okay so even though you say you have to configure test runners and, and all of that if you're using the default setup it's just as easy as Striker in it, uh, answer a question, and you don't even have to touch the configuration from there. Yeah, but of course, uh, since we don't have any conventions, yeah, if you're using Angular and you're using the Angular convention, then it will work like this. But otherwise, you'll have to do some digging into our configuration options to make it work for your use case. There's no way around that. We yeah, it's, it's we want to support everything. That's one of our roles, having mutation testing for every JavaScript uh, framework. Just it just uh, it's difficult to make it easy in that case. So we chose to have well, let's at least support everything and make it fast and make it easy. Or second to that, let's just it first support everything so you can at least use it yeah yeah so i I was actually amazed when i i created an angular app and then i went to add striker and it was just like you said install the cli globally run striker in it and then striker run and that's it then i had mutation testing with all these colorful colorful mutation reports and, and all of that nice stuff so that was that was an amazing onboarding experience of course like you're saying so many people are not using karma with angular even though it's the default there's a lot of people also using jest so i don't remember whether it's asking you if you're using karma or something else but if not you'll have to go in and configure the test runner like which test runner in the um, striker mutation uh, configuration 
Yeah, so we have a config file. It's generated for you then if you do striker init. And there you will have to configure the Jest test runner in that case because probably you're not using Karma then. You're using Jest. Yeah. And we yeah, we have plans uh, actually for the next half year to improve the Jest uh, support because we started the Boca and Karma. Uh, later we added Jest, but we haven't given it the love it deserves, I think. It's also, if you know a little bit about Jest, but Jest does a lot for you in the background. So that makes it difficult for us to support it. But I uh, I went to their uh, to their issue issue tracker i added some issues for like hot reloading and all these things because we need a little bit more support and they're really straightforward to answering the questions and so i'm pretty pretty uh, sure that we can add it add better support uh, but for now it's for example we don't support a coverage analysis for just that's a big one um, you can still run it you can still use it it will just be a little bit slower but it is on the roadmap right yeah definitely yeah so if you're using Vue CLI or Angular CLI or the Create React app, then basically it's very easy to to add Striker. And if not, well, you, you need to figure out how to to use the Striker configuration to um, set up your project. Yes, Alpha Vue. <laughs> to be honest, um, Vue CLI has a the nice habit of not having conventions either. So um, if you, for example, use the Vue CLI, you have uh, about 10 questions um, and yeah, you can 10 times 10. <laughs> I don't know how many answers you have, but you have a lot of uh, configuration options. So it's really difficult for us to really understand what's happening there. So you might do a little bit more configurations there by yourself, but we have the documentations on the Striker Handbook. If you have the websites, you can navigate to the Striker Handbook and there's a document that will help you there. And Okay, very good. Uh, so let's take a step back. Uh, how did the striker, this whole thing, how did it start? And were you there from the beginning? Yeah, so back in 2015, um, I was working at, at a big bank uh, in the Netherlands, and I saw a presentation about mutation, mutation testing for Java. And I thought, well, this is awesome. This is actually the holy grail of testing. I'm a big testing nerd, especially automated testing. So I'm really glad to see, wow, this is awesome. We need this for JavaScript because I was working on AngularJS back in the time. Um, but as you might imagine, open sourcing takes a lot of time. So I thought, why don't I write an internship for our company, InfoSupport? Um, so that's how it all started. I wrote an internship and uh, Simon joined uh, as a student back then. And he was actually, he saw the exact same presentation, which was kind of funny. We were both uh, sparked by the same pie testing presentation. Um, and then he came, he said, this is awesome. I want to work on mutation testing as well. So that was like a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> so we are... Uh, yeah, so we started with JavaScript. It was just for Karma back in the time, back in the day for AngularJS, which was like 80%, I don't know, but that was like a lot of the people were using it. So it was awesome that it worked. Um, yeah, then we started open sourcing it because I said, yeah, this has to be open source. Otherwise it will never work. Um, that's what back in 2016 it was. And actually the first commits you see in Striker repository is the exact end of the internship of uh, Simon. We didn't do any cleaning up. It was just JavaScript. Um, it was in English because we're, of course, in the Netherlands, so we have our own language. But uh, I said, well, just write it in English at the beginning. So then we can put it open source and everybody will at least understand the words. Um, so we did. Um, and then we actually uh, went ahead and added TypeScript to the project because I think if you have a big open source project, it makes a lot of sense to have types uh, in there, like TypeScript. Um, yeah, I, I don't see a lot of reasons not to have TypeScript anymore these days. I think you might agree with the uh, Angular experience. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, 2015, it was not a given as it basically is today. So those were different times. Yes. Um, yeah, so we moved to TypeScript. It took some effort, but then we did. Uh, back in the day, then, we still, if you wanted to run Striker on TypeScript projects, we would first compile your TypeScript to JavaScript. Then you would mutation test your JavaScript. Um, so it was really a big uh, hassle. And of course, then you needed to see the mutation testing report. You saw your JavaScript code there. Um, which was not nice. You want to see your TypeScript code. Um, so we decided to add TypeScript support. So another intern came in, uh, investigated the TypeScript support. And then we did in 2017. Um, also around the same time, we released the bundled zero. Um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, if you remember, 2017 was a different time, right? So there was no overarching like Babel or something. Um, it, it's either TypeScript was a separate ecology, like JavaScript was its own separate place. So we actually had two two uh, uh, striker versions, one for TypeScript and one for JavaScript. Um, cool. 
So if you install Striker, one of the things it would ask is, do you do JavaScript or TypeScript? And then it would install the, the TypeScript mutator or the JavaScript mutator, um, which worked in the beginning. But um, later, TypeScript uh, decided, the TypeScript team decided, which is a golden uh, thing they did, is to say, well, we also support JavaScript. Not only that, but we also add TypeScript support to Babel. So uh, that's actually how mutation switching was possible because I, we didn't want to maintain like two kinds of mutation switching one for TypeScript and one for JavaScript. Um, so but with Babel from, from version 7, Babel 7 was, is now like one and a half years old, I think. But that made it possible for us to say, well, we don't need two code bases anymore. We can just say, we can just have one implementation and it will work for any any project because of course, Babel also supports uh, like GSX and um, other uh, plugins that you might use in Babel, uh, stage zero uh, features. So actually that's a um, little bit sidetracked, but that's the reason we did, uh, we, we could we could implement mutation switching and then uh well going back in time then in 2019 we started uh yeah th that's when we decided to say well we don't want to have this just for javascript we also want to have it for dotnet and for scala so then that's is when we we found uh, richard and hugo to uh, uh interns back then um and yeah they ended up inventing this mutation switching thing and implementing it in their frameworks um and they are also open source and you can also use them for your code if you have, if you write scala or uh, c sharp code uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to take them for a spin. I, I also do .NET on a daily basis, so I'm going to add it in the next hackathon. <laughs> nice. So uh, um, it's still a 0.x release, but I said to them yesterday, you have to release 1.0 because it's already far more mature than we were back in the day when we released 1.0. It already has coverage analysis. It already has uh, awesome reports. And so they they are, they are uh, aware of it and they will do it uh, in the next... Uh, I, I hope half a year, but you, I, I would suggest just give it a spin. It's really mature. Um, yeah. Nice. Uh, what about the name? Was it you who came up with that? No, it's a, a, our colleague, um, Tom Coles, he's, he's called, and he, uh, he said, well, it's a mutation testing framework, right? So why don't you use an X-Men reference? And uh, well, there's a lot of X-Men references already out there, but Stryker wasn't one of them. So uh, if you know William Stryker, um, he's the one in X-Men that says, well, it's fine to have mutants as long as you can control them. So that's yeah. actually what Stryker does. Stryker controls mutants. So we thought, oh, that's, that's a good name. And later we found out there's a, apparently a company <laughs> in America, <laughs> pretty big. Oh. <laughs> also called really? Stryker. So that's like unfortunate, but not a big issue. I think, uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's pretty clear that we went with the uh, X-Men name and not, uh, nothing with the company. Hmm. Yeah. So no business domain overlap. I hope not. They're in weapons, so... Oh, <laughs> okay. That's a different thing. Okay, so Stryker controls... Stryker controls the mutants, and your tests your tests are killing the mutants. That's that's the idea. Yeah. That's the idea. Nice. It's a good name. It's a good name. Um, okay, and if there are any listeners here that are already familiar with Stryker, of course, uh, you wrote um, an, announce an announcement for version 4, and you just published it on indev.dev as well. And in there, you can see all the details about what has changed and breaking changes and improvements and all of these things. So, yeah. so for people already familiar, go and, and read that. That is really interesting stuff. Uh, you must have spent a lot of hours on, on this project. Uh, yeah, yeah. How, how much time did you, how, how much time did it take from to start working on what you considered version four until it, until it was finished? Um, so it took me the entire uh, lockdown period of Corona, the COVID-19 situation. So from February on, I was actually traveling like 20 hours a week uh, to my comp to the work and back and that fell away. So <laughs> I was just working from home. So I was thinking, because I was already thinking of, we have to have mutation switching because we were kind of at a roadblock, I would say, because it's without, um, yeah, without mutation switching, we couldn't really improve the performance like we wanted to um so i was already think thinking of it like a year long so it's it's already in my mind for since striker.net actually so um i was finally like yeah this is the moment i finally have the time um i i, I was planning a marriage but uh a wedding so that one got cancelled as well so wow <laughs> Yeah, my calendar was free, so I thought, well, let's just implement this. Uh, oh, it was not cancelled because of Striker 4? I hope not. No, okay, <laughs> good. 
Okay. Uh, no, no, it's uh, yeah, with the COVID situation, we were just yeah. we wanted to do it in March. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, good luck with that. It wasn't uh, feasible. Right. Any shout outs to people who help up out a lot with the uh, version four? Um, yes, we have. Uh, let me just look them up because I'm really bad with names. I have to excuse myself. But uh, we have uh, uh, like five people came along and helped us a lot um, with Striker 4. Because, yeah, uh, this was the first time actually we did a beta, an extended beta. Um, because, yeah, it's actually a complete rewrite of the code. Um, and I, I didn't feel good to just put it out there and let pe- users run into issues. Because I was pretty sure that it, it had a lot of issues. So, um, yeah, I'm just using their open source names. But Gramster, uh, KMD Grog, uh, Lakitna, uh, Rodibits and Garrett, they all helped out a lot and uh, I put them also in the blog article so you can look them up. And yeah, they just started running Striker on Prettier. They started running Striker on React and just running into all these issues and a lot of bugs actually also. About, about 20 issues we found, of more than 40 even. So that's... Uh, nice. So, I, so you spent eight, around eight months on version four? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, and not full-time, of course, but I would I can say 20 hours a week, I think, with ease. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's a, a big effort. And congratulations on, on finishing it. <laughs> Thank you. Feels great. So I was thinking how many users you have of Striker, and I see here on NPM, it's around uh, 28,000 weekly downloads at this point. Yeah, and uh, a year ago it was fourteen thousand. So you have doubled the number of downloads in one year. That's that's pretty impressive. Thank you. Yeah, we're, um, we're that's our tracker as well to track the popularity, and we see a doubling from last year. Basically, yeah, we're really happy with that. What is the most interesting project that you know of that Striker has been used for? Um, yeah, it's it's difficult to name the companies. Um, but there was uh, there's a, a big international um, uh, like cloud provider that's using it. I know of um, and a big payments provider as well. So um, we're still working out the details to get them on our website, um, like backers or users of Striker. Um, this is also um, yeah because yeah we're just figuring out this open source world. Um, I've been doing this for five years now, but the community thing is is still pretty new to me. Um, so I, I still need to invest more time into that. Uh, but there's yeah there's a lot of closed source projects that are using Striker daily. Um, yeah, for the for open source, there's uh, there's actually more closed source I think for JavaScript than ac- actually open source. But there are the component libraries that uh, um, that you can use it on. Uh, but I'm just not I cannot name one off the top of my head right now that's using it actively. What about in info support? What kind of work are you doing there, and and how are you applying Striker to those? Um, yeah, I'm working for an insurance company at the moment as a lead developer, and I'm, yeah, we're using Striker inside of our um, TypeScript projects we're running on Node.js, so that uh, is actually a pretty good fit. Um, so we recently started using Four Striker uh, Four as well, so I'm really happy with that. We also see the performance improvements there. Um, Striker.net is also used uh, in a lot of our projects because we are traditionally a bit more backend focused. Uh, so a lot of C-sharp development. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. And also for Java code, we're using PyTest because that's an awesome mutation testing framework for Java. And uh, yeah, Striker for Scala has a little bit less of traction at the moment because Scala is not that big in our site, our company. But internationally, it has seen some traction as well. Also some outside contribu- contribution contributions. Yeah, very nice. Uh, is there any other mutation testing framework for JavaScript? There are some proof of concepts out there, I would say, um, but nothing in on this scope. Okay, very nice. Um, so there are a few related projects. In particular, there's the Striker dashboard. What's that all about? Uh, Striker dashboard is a, a, a place to put your mutation reports. Um, it's only for open source projects at the moment, but the, the idea is that you have this uh, this badge on your README, with, which says, well, we have 80% mutation score. And if you click on the badge, you get the actual report that's behind it. So you can, as an open source contributor, you can just look at the report, see all places to improve. You don't even have to run Striker on your local machine in that case. You can just uh, start doing it. It also helps with spreading the word about mutation testing because you always see the code coverage batches, right? But uh, start using mutation testing batches. It's a lot more accurate for your test's uh, quality. 
Yeah, I recently started um, uh, helping to maintain a library for Angular called Lumberjack. It's a lo logging library, so Lumberjack. And one of the items I put on the backlog is to add Striker and then to add a mutation report and, and hopefully the dashboard as well. So that'll, that'll be an interesting project. Yeah, that's great. That's the goal indeed to have uh, more knowledge sharing and more spread of the word that way. There's also this uh, project called the uh, Mutation Testing Elements. Yes, Is that right? Testing Elements. Yeah, um, it's actually, it started in Striker. Um, it's the HTML reporter. So if you run mutation testing, then you get this nice, I, I, you said it was nice. I just echo what you're saying. Yeah. Um, with a colorful reports uh, with red squiggly lines and, uh, and emojis to say, well, these are mutants that survived. And when we started with Striker.net and Striker for S, uh, we of course wanted to have that as well. But for our for us, did it make sense to just copy paste code and uh, and rewrite the whole thing in the in the language of choice? So instead, we said, well, let's just make this uh, 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 yeah web component library for anyone to use. So that's what mutation testing elements is. It's a web components library to display mutation testing reports, and we're using it uh, of course in the Striker versions. And you can also activate it, for example, in PyTest uh, at the moment with the plugin, uh, because PyTest traditionally has a like a, a pretty basic report. Let's say let's be nice, <laughs> but it's not for web developers. It's like okay, this this this, this is not working for me. This is like from the nineties. So you can also oh. activate the mutation testing report there. With the plugin. Okay, so so if you had a mutation testing framework in another language, uh, you could add this in a plugin somehow. Yes, um, it uses a, a, a schema, a JSON schema, to define the input. Uh, for the for the uh, for the web component, and then um, you can point it to it to, with your source attributes or with the data attributes. You can just say this is the data and display that for me. And so as long as they adhere to the mutation testing schema, then it can display it. Um, and being a web component technology, I'm really in, I'm really interested in that technology stack. I think it's the future for web development at this moment in time. It's a no-brainer um, for me personally. As long as uh, as you can run in a browser, why don't just use web components, right? And uh, for example, our dashboard is written in Angular um, and adding the dashboard to the, oh, sorry, um, when I added the report to the dashboard, it was like oh, just uh, adding a dependency and putting it in and it will work there. But it will also work, of course, in your Re React application because of the web components to work in any, uh, yeah, in any browser. Yeah, and um, I want to try to describe what it looks like because it is an interactive report. So of course you have this familiar layout of the file and folder structure where you go to the individual files and you have an overview of the, is it, do you have the mutation score per file as well while navigating? Yeah. And then when you get into a, a single file, well, you see the source code and then you see how many mutations, uh, mutants were created. And then you can enable like the ones that survived and you can see exactly where in the code they were injected. And what the mute, like wh how did it change the code? So that is very very helpful insight when trying to figure out oh how could I like what what did I miss with my test? Yeah, that's a good description. And don't forget about the emojis, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, so, so there is no mutant emoji uh, yet, but you're using the alien and the space invader or something like that. Yeah, yeah don't tell them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, yeah, it's pretty pretty colorful and, and very funny and interactive, and yeah, I I love testing as well. So it's kind of a game, gamification, and yeah, it's just very interesting to get these tools to help you out when you're writing your tests. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was the goal. Yeah, and and you succeeded. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, so the mutation score is based uh, of a few components, and I don't, I don't think we can cover them all uh, right now in this conversation. But I remember that, for example, there's a compilation error, and you can choose to um, basically say that they are not really surviving mutants because if you change the code in TypeScript, well, they it wouldn't compile anyways. So it's not really a, a valid change. Um, there's also, well, this code wasn't covered by tests at all. So of course it survived. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and I think I think some of these types of mutants, uh, maybe there are some performance benefits as well when you can use the coverage analysis and the, the type checker so you don't have to run that additional mutant code. Is that a correct assumption? Not, not really. Uh, oh, <laughs> for, for the no coverage, for the no coverage, definitely right. So don't do work that you you don't have to. So if you know it's not covered, then you also know that a mutation will survive. So no coverage makes a lot of sense. But um, yeah, the compile error in TypeScript is um, we have it. It's a plugin. It's called the TypeScript Checker. So it can check your mutants for type errors. And we're using it in Striker because I love uh, TypeScript and I love uh, good quality reports. And the best quality is to have the comp compilation errors filtered out so you don't see them. But unfortunately, Mutation Testing Framework is mutating your code. Um, it's it's impossible to not make type errors. You might know that TypeScript is like really complex. Um, for us to not introduce type errors would be would mean that it would be at least as complex as TypeScript itself. So therefore we said that's not the way we want to go. So instead we just ignore type errors um, when, when introducing the mutants. And then we have this plugin to, to do it after the fact. So it's when you run Striker, it will also run the type checking for the mutants. But oh, okay. Yeah. So but since yeah, TypeScript is slow, that will like usually make it 10 times slower. Um, so I just uh, yesterday wrote an internship for it. So if you are interested in uh, solving this, you're a student around the Netherlands, uh, you're welcome, or Belgium, of course, you're welcome to, uh, to come along and uh, fix this for us. Nice. Uh, what's the website name of InfoSupport? It's infosupport.com. So just okay. the word InfoSupport. Yeah, you can click on the career. career. It's called and then. Yeah. Nice. And then you get to work with Nico and mutation testing. Yeah. So uh, I hope you like me. <laughs> um, oh, this this is important for the thing maybe to mention is for info support. Uh, it's like yeah, why? Because they are giving us the time to work on Striker and on other open source projects. And for us, it, it makes the the most sense to not use it for commercial benefits directly. For example, uh, you have to pay to use Striker. That's not what we want. But of course, if, uh, it would be nice if you're a student. Um, that's our, our goal, of course, to 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 grow. And um, we are a consultancy firm, so we are we have the top knowledge, I think, for, for a lot of uh, projects and frameworks. So if you want to come work for us, yeah, we have awesome assignments, and your code can be open source, and you can work on open source. Yeah, that is that's really nice. Uh, not all companies offer that, so it's a good opportunity. Yeah, I th also think it's a fair business model. It's not like we don't, don't want to advertise and all these things. Just want to say what we do, what we're doing. So that's yeah, fair. that's fair. <laughs> okay. Um, any other topics that you you want to cover today? Um, maybe one other uh, mutant state. Uh, it's called a timeout. So um, basically, when we're mutating your code, we can also introduce uh, infinite loops. Right? We just we don't know exactly what code does. Um, that would make it impossible. That's actually impossible to make a program that understands another program. So don't. Yeah. Do <laughs> It's it's uh, investigated. It's uh, impossible to do. Um, so instead, we just yeah we calculate a timeout, and when the threshold is reached, then we just kill the process and report it as timed out. So if you're thinking, how can it know that it doesn't time out? It cannot know. We just we just run and we kill the process and then start again for that uh, mutant at least. So or no, yeah, we, we skip it and it's reported as timed out. Yeah. So uh, how does that count towards the mutation score? Um, right now, it's it's counted as killed. Um, why did we chose that? Well, if you would introduce it, probably your CI/CD pipeline will fail because your time your tests would fail with a timeout. So it makes sense to say, well, just count it as killed. Yeah, and I think it's a pretty fair assumption that you have a CI pipeline in 2020. Let's let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's hope that. Okay. Anything else um, interesting we, we missed? Um, yeah, a lot, but uh, <laughs> in the interest of time, I think it's a, it's a good introduction and I hope the listeners liked it. Definitely. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for, for helping uh, come here and introduce it and cover all of this. Uh, hopefully, a lot of people will, will go try it out. It's uh, called striker-mutator.io. That's the website, right? And of course, everything is, is open source on, on GitHub. And you, you even have a, a Slack uh, workspace as well for all the frameworks. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So uh, everything is out in the open. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, the honor is all mine. I, I think it's awesome. I like podcasts, listening to him. So I love podcasts. I love to listen to to podcasts. So I'm really honored to be on the, on the on your podcast. Oh well, it's my pleasure. Um, is there anything you want to promote? Because now it's time for shameless plugs. Shameless. Uh, well, I, I would just say try it out, try it out on your project um, and let us know what you think. Um, you can also follow us on on uh, Twitter. It's striker underscore mutator is the handle, uh, and my personal handle is uh, underscore Nico GS. Uh, Nico GS was already taken, so I added to uh, to add it with an underscore. Okay, and I'll also mention again that you have internships and info support. Uh, so if any of this sounds interesting, go look that up as well on infosupport.com. Yeah. yeah, we have four, I think, right now. So, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's, uh, how, how big is that company? Uh, we have 500 people, I think. Oh. Somewhere around there. And um, I think about 10 interns graduated uh, with a striker assignment. And we have four like uh, open assignments right now. And two, two are uh, doing it right now. Our interns are right now working. Um, so, that, uh, so it's really cool to see it grow like that. Nice. Okay. So it, it benefits the business and uh, the other way around also benefits striker. Yeah, definitely. We, we use every assignment. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming today, Nico. Uh, maybe we could go uh, one step deeper another time. We'll we'll have to get back on, back on that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for uh, for having me. You're welcome. See you, everyone. Yeah. Bye. The deep dive was brought to you by InDepth.dev. <laughs>